Kippur pre uh, Sukkot uh, Shi'ur um, uh, with uh, with Sunny Epstein, and we are going to be learning about inclusive communities in the lesson of the uh, from Yona and Arba Minim that uh, that Sunny has prepared. I want to thank Simon Kamenetsky and Jonathan Wolf for sponsoring this Limud Torah. Thank you so much, Simon and Jonathan. And, um, uh, you, you know, we are kind of, you know, embarking as we are, uh, in, you know, in other areas um, in expanding our uh, offerings for learning. And so if you have ever have ideas of topics you'd like to cover or areas you'd like to explore or teachers you think that would be great for us to highlight, please know that, that Eshel is now expanding this area of education and we'd love your input. And with that, um, Inclusive Communities by uh, Sunny Epstein. Great, great. So I would like to begin by just having all of us, I don't know, can we see everybody uh, get, get that? Just to see everybody's faces. And what, to ask some basic questions, what does it mean for us, for a community to be inclusive? What do we do? How do we handle a community that may be limited for whatever reasons in reaching this ideal or goal? What groups of people in our communities are at risk for not being included as they need to be? What does a community have to do to be inclusive? And who sets parameters for any non-inclusive practices? So those are some questions that I would like everybody to keep in mind and maybe even jot down any reactions you have to that. As I go through the very beginning of looking at some sources. So the first two sources are not on your source sheet. They are being presented because I do Yom Kippur by myself all the time. And I always find that Yom Kippur gives me a different experience every year. And this year I was struck by something that I want to share. When we say Kol Nidre, as part of Kol Nidre, which is actually this legal formulation, it's not a prayer per se. One of the things that we do before we actually say, the last thing we do before we say Kol Nidre is we say the following. With the agreement of God and the agreement of the community and the heavenly council and with all of our understanding, we are praying. We allow ourselves to pray with the transgressors amongst us. What does that mean? Who are the transgressors? And of course, then we go to Kol Nidre and the transgression that we're really talking about in this legal formulation are vows that have been made. And we're taught that better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not be able to do what needs to be done or sometimes the vow itself can be faulty in its very content. For those of you who may have the corn sidor uh, or machzer for Yom Kippur, Write down pages 770 to 771 at your leisure, where you can go and find the following. When you come to Kol Nidre, we come together as a community. And we say we are all transgressors. We are here with transgressors. We are all the same. We are not perfect people. And then juxtapose that with this from Hineni. Hineni what the leader with the Shliach Tibor says before Musa. Hinani, here I am. The single word is the ultimate human response, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, to the call of God. When God summons us, God calls our name. Here I am, says Abraham. Jacob, Moshe, Shmuel, Yishiahu, answer in one way or another. At the beginning of the human story in Gan Eden, God called to Adam and Chava, where are you? 
God has done so ever since. God calls to each of us, wherever we are, whatever person we are, in whatever situation, in whatever time, saying, there is something that only you can do. The Chabad concept of shlichut. You have your shlichut. You have a reason for being here. God may command in generalities, Rabbi Sachs continues to teach, but cause in particulars. God knows our gifts. God knows the needs of the world. God knows how to match up our individual gifts with that world. If there is an act that only we can do and only at this time, then it is our task to do it. The sum of these tasks is the meaning of our life, the purpose of our existence, the story we are called to write. God's cause almost inaudible. It speaks in a still small voice, meaning a voice that we can only hear if we are listening intentionally. But it is there. And if from time to time throughout our lives, we create a silence in the soul, we will hear it. Our lives offered in faith and trust are the answer to God's question. There's no life without a task, without a purpose. There's no person without a talent, no place without a fragment of God's life waiting to be discovered and redeemed, no situation without its possibility of sanctification, no moment without its call. It may take us a lifetime to learn how to find these things. But once we learn, we realize in retrospect that all it ever took was the ability to listen. Shema. When God calls, God whispers our name. And the greatest reply is, Hineni, here I am. I am ready, God, to heed your call, to mend a fragment of your all too broken world. In thinking about the collective nature of Kol Nidre and coming together with everybody and saying up front that we are all transgressors in somehow, and we all need each other to help heal our respective degrees of brokenness. And then, we hear in the beginning of Musaf in this beautiful, beautiful plaintive prayer that each one of us has a special talent, a special way, a special acumen that we can use to heal the collective. I think that's a really powerful message. And I think when we think of inclusivity, why do we have to be inclusive? Because everybody brings their special gifts. Why is everybody bringing their special gifts? Because my gift will help somebody else, their gift will help another person, and that person will help me. And that's the way we become a community. We learn by what we have to offer to each other and by listening and attuning ourselves to that offering, to those offerings collectively. But the community has to embrace what we all have to offer. So before I go any further with the sources, I would like to go back to those first questions that appear on the screen now. And if anybody has any thoughts about any of them that came to you through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that you're carrying with you into Sukkot, what is it that we are missing? What is it that we offer? What is it that helps us make our communities more inclusive? If we think of those with emotional or mental or psychological limitations, uh, we have a young man in one of the shuls that we're associated with who has uh, some mental limitations uh, significantly. And he comes to shul and now he goes up at the end of services and says, I don't alum, like the little kids do, and everybody makes a big deal of it. But I think more than he gets out of it, I think everyone else gets so much out of having him there. If, if you think of whatever category you want as LGBT folks or as people with various uh, physical issues or learning issues, Jews of color, um, people that are, there, there are so many different categories of people, Hirim, who are new to the community, unaffiliated, all of those. We have an obligation to include all of them. And when we're saying that we will daven with the transgressors, that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about not taking one's words seriously or not being 
intentional about what we are doing. So I think that if we reframe who we are, I, I just got off the phone, a very, very long conversation with one of our rabbis from the Welcoming Shuls Project, who was telling me that he's concerned and it bothers him that people in the community will not talk about some of the groups that are present in the community. Why do we do that? Each one of us has something so wonderful to offer. So let's look at uh, source number one, uh, a lesson from Yona. And what I did was we all read Yona on Yom Kippur, or we're familiar with the story. And I took just little snippets regarding who do we include in our community? One of the things that I do in my life among many is that I help people prepare for a Beit Din when they are converting. So I have studied with these folks. I have brought them to show with me and seated them next to me and walked them through the, the prayers and helped them become more comfortable and aware of what's going on. So I've had this experience with those quote unquote outside of the circle. So let's look at this. Yona, the Lord, the word of God comes to Yona and says to him, Kum lech al nin gadola. That's the charge. Go to that city of Nineveh, that big city. And I am sure many of us know the drash that Nineveh is the letters of the name of God and the Nun, uh, which is five times 10, Yud times He in Gematria means that city that may be far, but it's close to God. And call unto them that their wickedness has come in front of me. But Yonah gets up and he flees instead to Tarshish, uh, created by the last three letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Tuf Reshin, going as far from Nineveh as he possibly can. And he goes down, he finds a ship, he pays the fare, he gets on. Why? His goal is to flee Milifne Hashem, to flee from the face of God, which of course is a ridiculous plan. It's not going to work. They then, the story goes on, and they, he goes asleep, and the storms flail, and they say, who's, on whose account is this? And he says that uh, it's, it's my fault, cast me overboard. They take Yonah, they cast him into the sea, and the sea stops raging. Then what happens as a result of that? By Yeru HaNashim The sailors, not exactly a religious kolel bunch, now fear or have awe for God. They are like literally awe struck. And they offer a sacrifice to God. They make what? Nidarim, vows. Call Nidre. So they promise to do better because of this experience. Page two. Now what happens is we go through this whole drama, Jonas and the fish, he spit out all of that. And then we see in Tarek Gimel, chapter three, verse bet, pasuk bet, is exactly the same as Perak Aleph, pasuk bet, kum lechel ninvah Again, God says, get up and go to that city Ninveh, that big city, and go and tell them that if they don't behave themselves, this is what's going to happen to them. Yona goes, it's a three-day journey. He enters, he says, 40 days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And what do the people do? They, they're they confused, and they're upset, and they turn it around. They believe in God. Again, so we've got two groups here. The sailors, who have awe for God, and now the Ninevites as well. They proclaim a fast, they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And again, you get the uh, kind of tropes of, of Yom Kippur here. Yon is not happy. He's angry. He doesn't want that inclusivity. He doesn't want these people to be part of his kehila. He prays to God and he says, what, what do I have to do with this? Why did you give me this task? 
So I went to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious God, compassionate, long suffering, and abundant, all of that. And again, you've got this trope from the Yom Kippur prayers of the, the characteristics of God. And then he says, God, take my life. It's better. My death is better than my life. I don't want to live anymore. Why doesn't he want to live? Um, when we think of some of our communities that are so welcoming and that are embracing of everybody, we only have to gain. We learn from each other. We learn with each other. We add to each other's lives. We share our spiritual journeys. And you don't have to set out to do anything. It's just that task that God gives you, just like the task that God gives the shliach tibor to say, hineni, here I am, hineni. Why do you think Yonah does not want to include these groups in his community of faith? And when you look at God, what do you think the lesson is that Yonah is being taught here about who he is and who the sailors are and the Ninevites are? We all like to think that we're special. We all like to think that we understand who's in, who's out. Uh, we may feel threatened by some groups, um, but yet the reality is that we know, uh, we learn repeatedly, the more, the merrier, two are better than one, and that if we can join together, the collective is so much more than the sum total of the individual parts. Source number two is the unity of our people. <clears throat> this is from Chabad. And it's about the four species. So we all know the symbolism of the four species. Uh, we know that uh, they mean many things, parts of the body. One is that we, some people learn Torah, some people do Masim Tovim, good things, some people do both, some people do neither. So we could understand why we might want people in our community who are both doing Matsim Tovim and learning Torah. We can understand why we might want people who are doing Masim Tovim but not learning Torah. And we can understand why we would have people who are learning Torah but not necessarily doing deeds of tzedakah and gemilu chasadim and all of that. But why and for what purpose do we want or do we include the person who does neither. Why is that person included in this group? Those of us that have grown up religious or that have been observant our entire lives, have you ever had the following experience? Either I'm teaching somebody for conversion or I'm doing something with someone that doesn't necessarily know a lot or whatever it is, whatever the situation is. I'm in my interfaith world and working with people that are not Jewish. And somebody will come up with the most incredible insight that you never saw because you're right in the middle of it all, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when it says that that person is not learning Torah and is not doing Masim Tovim, I think that first of all, what's the Chabad term or, or expression? Not yet, right? They're not doing it yet. But I think also they're there for us to learn from their journey. Uh, my kids participated in um, uh, Chabad's program, the Friendship Circle, and they worked with uh, a little girl for many years who ultimately unfortunately died, but uh, who had a lot of issues, a lot of problems. And I would listen sometimes to them teaching her. That she, they would do, my twins did the Limo de Kodesh for this little girl, Rina. And Rena would come up, she was, she was chronically ill, she had a lot of problems, she couldn't get, to, it, was, it was really a chaval situation, it was very difficult. But she would come up sometimes with the most incredible insights that my kids were like, oh my gosh, where does this little kid get that wisdom from? And I think that's um, what we need to think about. I love the, the years ago, I was, I was home ill one day and I was watching Oprah Winfrey, you know, one of the Rebellion of our of our generation, <laughs> and uh, she had F. Scott um, 
Peck, Scott Peck on. And they were talking about um, journeys and spirituality and all that. And she told the following story, which I thought was so beautiful. She said, I have this repeating dream. And in the dream, I'm always flying. And as I'm flying, I keep running into, or I keep meeting little kids. And every time I see a little child, I say, how are you? And the little child says, no, that's the wrong question. You're supposed to ask me, what was I sent here today to teach you? So I think that the idea that we all learn, what do we say? I learned from my teachers, more from my colleagues, but most of all from my students. In some ways, we may be that particular person's student. That person may be our teacher. And so all of these things are very important. Um, if you look at the top of page three, in the Midrash, we explain that the mitzvah of the lulav and etrog symbolizes the intrinsic unity of the Jewish people. That's why when we do this mitzvah, we hold them together, the fruit and the branches from the four different species, not separate, but together, because it does indicate our unity and that each gets something from the other. Each one is enhanced by the beauty of the other, by the taste, by the smell. All of this is enhancing our experience. If you look at the bottom of, uh, of the page, the bottom half, fulfillment depends on one's connection with his fellow man. And here we come back to inclusivity. The mitzvah of the lulav and etrog demonstrate that no individual can attain fulfillment unless one is willing to go beyond himself and join with his fellow person. We will not reach fulfillment unless we go beyond ourselves and join with others. I do this very, very simple thing. Me is an M, if you think about it. My writing is not very good right now, so you'll have to forgive me, but hopefully this will work. Me, if you think of an M, me, it's closed at the bottom and at the top, nothing comes in, right? But if you, op if you do this and you open up that top, there's all kinds of places for the influence and the teachings of others to come in. And I think when we are we, we're much better off. The sum total of who we are, our inclusive communities. I have had rabbis tell me in my work, working with the uh, Welcoming Shoals Project, how much they've learned from individuals who have been part of their kahilos and how grateful they are to have us and our families and our children and our spouses and whoever else there. And that to me, they get it, they get it. How appreciative they are of the women in their kahila and their knowledge. How appreciative they are of the people who have struggles and yet who come and who are part of the kihila. We all have so much to offer as our gifts, our shlichut. No matter how much we develop ourselves as individuals in that same paragraph, the uh, bolding and underlining is mine, by the way, we cannot reach our true potential without the help of others. The unity of our people as a whole is an indispensable ingredient in the growth and progress of every individual. That's why the lulav may only be used for the mitzvah if its leaves are bound together. That's why we have those little things going up that hold the leaves together. The motif of unity on the bottom of the page is also reflected in the etrog. The etrog represents a category of people whose potential for achievement is greater than that of others. Its emphasis on unity must be greater. I've uh, been an educator, a teacher, all kids, all ages, adults, little ones, everybody across the board, all settings. And one of the things that I've noted is that when people are really trying, when you get that student who's really struggling, who's really just not getting it, again, you learn so much from their struggle. 
There's a beautiful story from the Chazan Ish who teaches that when a group of students were learning and a Rav would walk in the room, everybody would stand out of respect for the Rav. So there was this guy, he was shabby, not well dressed, not well put together, he smelled. He was, you know, just not somebody who people wanted to include. And he would come in late all the time. And when he would come up, the Chazonish would stand up. And of course, if your Rebbe stands up, everybody else stands up and wait for him to sit down. So his students say to him, I have a question. I don't understand. I understand for us to stand when a great Rav walks in the door. But this guy, why are you standing for him? And his answer was, you need to understand. That man is very sick and very poor and very compromised. But every day he gets up, he gets dressed, he puts himself together the best he can, and he comes to my shiur. When I'm not feeling well in the morning, when I'm thinking I'm just going to stay in bed or I'm just exhausted, I think of him. And I say, I've learned from this man that I can do this. That's an important lesson. That's a very important lesson. So we need everyone. We need that person that is coming in. It may be on the perimeter of the room. He might not be doing the Gamilo Chesed program and he might not be in the, in, in the Kolea or the Shia Rim, but we need that person because we have what to learn from him. On the top of page four, we must learn from the Etrog and not merely tolerate people of all kinds, including those with characters and personalities very different than our own, but actually grow through contact with their divergent perspectives. As the Mishnah teaches, who is wise? The one who learns from every human being. So, you know, the, the openness to, to differences like so, so rich here. I wonder, um, one of the things that Luce Irigare is a kind of, you know, feminist thinker uh, teaches that I think is really helpful is that the problem isn't difference. The problem is the difference between differences. And that, as you said in the beginning, so the religious differences or the observance differences that Avar Yanim are welcomed is of an entirely other matter than hearing loss or, and hearing loss or difficulties is different than, um, than LGBT exclusion and actually Absolutely. Gay and lesbian exclusion is different than trans exclusion, and and that's different than the presence of a non-Jew right. in the community, and it's different from the presence of a person who um, might be a white supremacist who's come to to kind of see the community in order to understand his enemy. You understand? Like, I, there's a the the problem I think that we always face is is that. We're, we're all kind of addicted to familiarity and, in, and, and, and enamored in terms of like our curiosity around difference. But that, I think it's, it ends up being a little bit more complicated because the, you know, um, I just think that like it matters what, what we're talking about. Like not all, not all otherness is equal. Absolutely. But it is other. And, and one of the things that I, there's a correlative principle here, I think, in that I don't think it's an accident that the communities that are most inclusive are the ones that somehow, like the groups that we mentioned in the beginning, that you know, somebody said, you are not inclusive of physically handicapped people just by putting in a ramp. Are they welcome? Do people look at them at eyeball level if they are, if they need a wheelchair to get around? Uh, do you take somebody who's visually impaired by the hand and bring them in? Do you uh, welcome the person of color? Do you, I, I think the differences and the otherness is, is different, 
but I think the aversion to difference is something that can potentially close people off to anyone who is in any way different than them. And I think, for example, we are seeing that in the Orthodox community, where I often hear, and, St and, and uh, Steve, you and I have discussed this very, very many times, that um, people just want to be with individuals that are just the same as them. I, I speak to rabbis and shuls in very accepting right. and, and left-pitched communities. And I've had two, two or three times, the rabbi has said to me, you know what? You're right. This community is very open. There's a lot of LGBT folks here. Here, It shouldn't be an issue. But my people come to our shul to get away from it all because they see it on the street and they don't want it in their shul. So I think that, you know, I, I almost feel like the question is, where do you retreat to? Um, we, we live, we live in a community that is racially diverse. Uh, we have LGBT all over the, all over the place. We have same sex, same gender uh, couples. We have uh, gender non-conforming folks. We have every religion, every nationality. We have some Zoroastrians around the corner. I don't think it's an accident that in this community in which I live, you have so many differences because everybody knows that differences are accommodated and people are welcoming to all. If we see somebody who's in a wheelchair, nobody thinks twice about walking off the sidewalk so that that person can continue. Right. So I do think there's, a, there's a, an acceptance of not me or a rejection of not me. When my parents died five years ago, within five weeks of each other, around this time, um, I went, it's the last time I went to our Black Hat Orthodox shul, which used to be for everybody. It used to, it, it really spanned everything, but then something happened. And I went to say Kaddish, and the way it's set up is that you have the big shul, the Ezra Tanashim, and then on the other side is a chapel. So during the week, they have the chapel, and there's a door between the chapel and the Ezra Tanashim. Two times I went, and two times they slammed the door. And I didn't go back for a whole bunch of reasons, but that was it. And the flip side of, of this, to speak about another group we haven't even mentioned, <clears throat> is that in this very right-wing conservative shul with a rabbi who actually came out of YU, by the way, um, it turns out that we have several military families in the U.S. armed forces. And we say to Philala Medina Yisrael, Chayalei Yisrael, for this country. And there was a question, should we start saying for our soldiers? And there was a very intelligent discussion and a very and of course, we include everybody. We include all kinds of different facets in who we are as a collective. And now that prayer is said, as well as the others, every Shabbat and every Yom Tov. Right, but it was birthed by a, the a <clears throat> of a presence of people. Absolutely. And and it's you know the it's hard to expect a community to think that they have to say it's fila for the American Armed Forces if no one in the community has any family members who are working in the Armed Forces. It just doesn't dawn on people. Mm -hmm. So it's the challenge, I think that what I'm kind of hearing is, is that the challenge is not a settled one. It mm -hmm. is always like a dynamic one because, because you know, the barriers shift. The familiarities that we're addicted to shift sure. and figuring out like, you know, what familiarity do we need to soften so that we can open up curiosity in a new place? You know, um, Avi Weiss had a, a group of Down syndrome kids that would be, you know, uh, they they come in on a bus on, on Shabbat at about like 10 o'clock <clears throat> and the, the shul was was primed to scoop these kids up and every family had like a connection. And it was a lovely period during which this happened. And then the school closed 
Mm. I don't think anything like that's ever occurred since. In other words, it was episodic by its own nature because need and opportunity came together and people responded. So right. there's something about this that has to do with that, which leads me to something that you've said before in your work, and that is that rabbis say, well, we don't have gay people here. Right, right. Right, and so, you know, figuring out how we navigate that, how we make openness without the pressure of a real human being. Right. That's an interesting question. I, I often talk to rabbis and I say, guys, you need, I just said it this morning or this afternoon and then this very long conversation I had, you need to develop the policies before the people are knocking at the door. And I think that that, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I also think that, you know, I, I, it's hard in some ways, you know, for some of us, we understand if you include all, you include all. But for some people, they are ticking off which groups are okay and which groups are not okay. And that's a whole other issue for a lot of reasons. I, I'll name a very sensitive issue around that, for example. Um, people who have compared, and I understand the comparison, but people who have compared same gender, same sex couples to intermarried couples. It's not an equivalent comparison. It really isn't. But that's in people's minds. Or someone who says, of course we have gay people. We also have people who don't observe Shabbat. We also have people who don't keep kosher. No, that's not. So I, I think we're talking about a gestalt, which unfortunately a lot of people just can't wrap their heads around in too many cases. So I want us to look for a moment at Chagiga and then underneath it, Nitzavim. Chagiga says, Everyone is obligated to come on the Shalosh Regalim, except for, <laughs> so deaf, mute, someone who's mentally um, incompetent, a minor, Tum Tum, which is a hermaphrodite, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, androgynous and hermaphrodite, and, and, and women and slaves who are not emancipated, and the lame and the blind and the sick and the old, and one who is unable to ascend on his own legs. So you've got three guys still remaining, okay? And clearly, what's the issue? So the rest of Chagiga talks about the offering that we bring um, on this occasion when everybody comes, and it also brings everybody back in. So for the half slave, for example, so you free the other half, so it's a free person, so they can come. And the child who has to ride on the father's shoulders, so if he can walk part of the way. And then we get these really important concepts called nachat ruach and simcha. And it has to do with smicha, with, lot, with, with laying the hands, leaning on the offering. And the way women are brought back in is to say, you know, women are not obligated because that's the word here. It's chayav, chayav, who is mechayev, who is obligated. And when we think about mitzvot, you have mechayev, you have obligated, you have mutar, you have permitted, you have a sore, you have forbidden, and you have pator, you have um, that you are exempt. Exempt is not the same as a sore. And that's where I think a lot of things get lost in translation. And we end up with all of these don'ts, 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 and they're not really supposed to be there. So the idea here is that if somebody wants to do this because it brings them joy, then the community should facilitate that process because it is a joyful thing and you don't wanna take away the opportunity for joy for someone. Now that idea alone, think about that. Um, when, when I had the door shut on me, when I was saying Kaddish, another time I went, it was during, a, um, it might've been the last Rosh Hashanah I ever appeared there. And the women on the women's side are going, shh, shh, cause they hear me saying Kaddish. And one like makes this disgusting and, and goes to the back to get away from me. And I walked out and that was it. I, I never went back. Um, I'm not obligated but I'm not a sore, I'm, it's not forbidden for me to say Kaddish. And trust me, my mother, when she had my brother, she, he was her Kaddish girl. He was the one who was gonna say Kaddish for her. It probably doesn't mean anything to her in Shemayin that I say Kaddish, but I want to say Kaddish. And there's nothing that is 
stopping me from doing so. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm not screaming it out. I'm just saying it because I want to. So I think this is something that we need to look at our Orthodox communities also. I'll use uh, Rabbi Greenberg's uh, sentence or statement, which I absolutely agree with. He says, until we deal with our women's issues, we're not even gonna get the LGBT folks or issues on the table. And I think there's a lot to that. I think that we as people, as individuals, we all have differences. And, and even in the disability world in education, now we're talking about learning differences. We're talking about different learners learn differently. We're not even using that word because in a way we're all disabled in some way or, or not completely abled or partially abled or whatever. But I think the idea that there's a way to accommodate uh, for the deaf mute or for the blind or for this one, we have several people who were going to Orthodox shuls. We're now coming to the same very traditional right-wing conservative shul. Why? Because they have a loop, because they have means so that people who are hearing impaired can participate in the service and can hear what's going on. And they put the microphones on very loud. They don't speak directly into them. They're just there. I mean, they, they do this so that people can be included and people are feeling, okay, they want me there. I, I am appreciated there. And some people may disagree with that. Again, the past six months with Zoom and everybody that put their um, computers on Zoom and left it on for 24 hours so that people could participate in Sadarm and all these things, yeah, it tested all of us. So when push comes to shove and we need to make those accommodations, we will make them, as we said, for those that we love and that are near and dear to us. The question is, can we look at our entire community that way? And can we say, so maybe this person isn't my relative, but it's Kenny's or it's Simon's friend. And I should care as much about that and those folks as I do my own family or my own circle. Then you go to Nitzavim, which we read recently. Atem Nitzavim Hayom Kulchem. Today you stand, all of you, before the Lord your God, your heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the people of Israel, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, your stranger, even from the, the hewer of the wood into the drawer of the water, everybody, no matter what your occupation is, no matter what your social position is, you are all included. And when you look at that, the notion that we can all come together even if our level of chiyuv is not the same and we accommodate that, that is not to say that we can't be a community. Uh, what do you do when somebody is, for example, um, mentally limited? This young man that I'm thinking of, uh, can he count a minion? So there's discussions about it. And the answer is, or one of the compelling options that are given is, and a lot of people go by this is, if he recognizes a bracha formula or somebody like just zesses him and he, he can say amen, he can count. Everybody is needed. I need someone to say amen to my bracha. Even if someone doesn't know, even if someone doesn't learn Torah, even if somebody isn't doing masim tovim in the community. So when you look at these two sources, three and four, and you see in one case, we're talking about who's obligated. But again, please note, that the entire Masechet after that brings people back in, aside from the obligation, there's other reasons. What if it's Simcha? What if somebody, it brings them joy? Nachat Ruach, it brings women pleasure to be able to do this. And by the way, Nachat Ruach is one of my favorite expressions because if you'll notice in our davening, um, before we, you know, in, as, as we go through the uh, Shema Birchatah, we say and we come with pleasant voices and Nachat Ruach, like, like emotional connection, love, that we want to be there. The next two resources are uh, just, I, I'm just going to go very quickly and then I'm going to open it up, okay? Our one is from uh, Bill Gavovich in Boston who wrote this beautiful piece and it talks about categories of people that need to be included. And the question that I pose at the end is, do you feel included in every possible way in these categories, do you want to add any groups of people? Are there people that were not there? And then the last one is 
uh, signs on the wall, lessons of an inclusive sukkah. So if you go to the bottom of page seven, I will just end with this little piece. Oh, and then there's one more text. We should all consider the sukkah as a particular contribution to the universal effort of creating community open to the diversity of the human experience, religion, sexuality, gender, race, culture, etc. In making room for everyone's identities, this hut, this hut truly becomes a sukkah shalom, a booth of peace. And finally, source seven is from uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Ashner, who has this organization in Israel called Bet Hillel that brings together rabbis, rabbaniot, and geim, uh, uh, LGBT folks, and trying to ask these questions. What does it mean to be inclusive? How do we make sure that we are concerned about everyone? How do we make sure, not that j just we include, but that we welcome, and not just that we welcome, but people feel embraced. So at the end, I put some thought questions on the bottom of page eight, and he ends with, Rabbi Ashner ends with the idea that um, they meet, they, they talk, they have many conferences around what this means to do to include the LGBT, and he says, Besides several conferences and meetings on the topic, the process included countless drafts, endless debates over email, and tearing our hair out over the turn of a phrase or possible implica implication. To maximize sensitivity while not compromising halacha. How do we maintain the traditional vidalad amot of the traditional boundaries of halacha and be sensitive within those parameters? How do we do both? And what compromises will have to be made to make this happen? Are we willing to engage in a process? And can we celebrate this Sukkot? How many strides have been made while acknowledging our commitment to stay on this journey? It's not for any of us to do it all. That just doesn't happen. But it is for all of us to do our part. I wish everybody a Chag Sukkot Sameach. And let, let's think, uh, look, I'm a fan of Lord, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. And he always says exactly what we, what we said earlier. If we want to be included, and if we want to be validated, we need to do it for everybody else. We need to be the first ones to get up when one group or another is maligned. And I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. So we all have to keep validating all inclusivity and be advocates, not just for people in our own categories, whatever those are, but all people, because we all have what to learn, including the person who may not be in the community, including the potential, you are including the one who may not know Torah or may not participate in the activities of the community.